this upcoming session, which is going to be a very interesting one. Matter of fact, um, I wish this was something that was available when I was a Rotarian 20 plus years ago, because it would have helped me better understand and appreciate my daughter and her struggle, and also all my friends who are who are gay. So I mean, I I really applaud our team putting this together and for Jason agreeing to talk to us tonight. And um, we have a phenomenal facilitator this evening, Lisa O'Halloran, and she will um, introduce our speaker tonight. And she will also give you some other ideas and things to um, do during this session. <clears throat> it should be very, very interesting because I had a sneak peek. Jason forwarded uh, his slide deck to us and it's a, a great presentation, a great presentation. He's got plenty of time left over for questions. So Lisa, take it away. Welcome everyone. We're so glad you're with us. Uh, just know we are recording the session tonight. We had lots yeah, of folks interested in the topic, um, but who are, were not able to join us. So we are recording the session. So it is my privilege to introduce our feature speaker tonight, Jason Ray. He is the founder and president, CEO of the Wisconsin LGBT Chamber of Commerce. Uh, which is an organization of more than 600 LGBT owned or allied businesses. And we're gonna learn more about allyship tonight, um, but they're businesses from around the state. He founded the organization in 2012 and has seen it grow to record numbers and achievements, including winning the National LGBT Chamber of Commerce's Chamber of the Year Award in 2015. He's responsible for the overall direction operations of the chamber, as well as membership outreach and retention. Not a surprise, his focus is building inclusion and diversity throughout Wisconsin uh, to make the state a truly welcoming and inclusive place. In his volunteer time, I don't know how he has time to do that with everything that he does, he's a member of the Democratic National Committee since 2004, where he became the youngest person ever elected to the DNC. And in 2017, he was elected as the secretary, one of the national officers. Jason is also a Rotarian. He's a member of the Rotary Club of Milwaukee, and he also holds bachelor's of arts degree from Marquette University in history and political science. So we have a fantastic person to navigate us through this topic tonight. Um, I welcome you, Jason, and take it away. Well, wonderful. Well, thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, everyone, for uh, being here tonight uh, on probably what is uh, the nicest day of the year that we've had uh, so far. I got in a, a little walk before we got to start today. Um, so uh, thank you for, for spending a little bit of time. Hopefully uh, you can see the slides that I just started sharing. I was trying to make sure that can work right. Perfect, I've got the thumbs up uh, from Lisa. Uh, but uh, as I said, my name is Jason Ray, pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, and I'm honored to serve as the, the president and CEO for the Wisconsin LGBT Chamber of Commerce. I'm really just excited for all of us to, to be together and that I think you know, as I'm going to try to highlight diversity, equity, and inclusion work is so important. I think the work that we do as Rotarians, a central element of that is really how do we build that inclusive community, that inclusive space for all individuals. So um, I've got a, a presentation built for tonight, but definitely want to, to find ways to make it interactive. So there's a couple spots throughout that I'm going to uh, invite you to submit answers via the chat box. Uh, so feel free to use the chat feature. Uh, tonight, feel free to pop in questions and we'll do our best to, to follow that, but um, we'll definitely make room at the end for as much Q&A as possible, um, as well as make sure to provide my contact information. There are often times uh, that I know when you, you leave a meeting, it's that question pops in your mind right away uh, after you hit end of the Zoom room that you wanted to ask, or uh, maybe there's something you want to know that um, we don't get to tonight and you'd rather talk about uh, offline, so happy to, to find ways to do that um, with all of you. But Tonight, I thought I would start by just uh, sharing just a little bit uh, of background and overview uh, on the chamber. Um, I founded the Wisconsin LGBT Chamber back in September of 2012. And as Lisa mentioned, we're a statewide business organization of almost 700 LGBTQ plus and allied owned businesses from across Wisconsin. We host more than hundred events a year, including a business equality summit, uh, a career fair, uh, a women's leadership luncheon, uh, and many more events. We have an online business directory where you can search all of our businesses, uh, as well as a job board so that individuals can find uh, positions with employers where they can bring their 
full and best self to work each and every day, all under the mission of how do we build that stronger pro-fairness community uh, and really attract LGBTQ allied visitors and guests to Wisconsin. We know that after marriage equality came uh, in the middle of you know, around 2015 or so, that wasn't the end of the journey that there's still so much more. And I'm gonna highlight a little bit tonight about where some of those efforts go, especially when it relates to uh, the workplace, but also housing and public accommodations uh, and more. So tonight I kind of have the presentation broken down um, in a few different areas. We'll start with an overview of, of the LGBTQ community uh, as a whole, share some statistics and some information there. We will get on the same page as far as language and I'm gonna avoid as much as I can uh, acronyms tonight, um, but we'll try to share what some of those will mean. We'll talk a little bit about um, current status, both on a local, state and federal level when it comes to the LGBTQ community. We'll talk about how you can be an advocate uh, and for those in the workplace, things that can be done in the workplace, which are really the starting blocks for how we build that inclusive community. So a lot to try to cover and get through, but I, uh, I know we're gonna have some fun together. So uh, we'll jump right in. And I always like to share any diversity, equity and inclusion presentation, looking at the iceberg model here. Um, and this shows just the different dimensions of diversity. And I, I like to show it because Oftentimes people assume diversity based on appearance or physical traits, language spoken, but there's so much that comes to this that people don't know about individuals. And especially when it comes to sexual orientation and gender identity, uh, all of those are, are internal things that you can't see externally from the outside. So how you know, we focus on uh, building this inclusive community really depends on us understanding that there's so many different facets of diversity that are, as this iceberg model shows, uh, below that waterline. So just something to keep in mind, but also to keep in mind in general when it comes to diversity work, because uh, there are so many intersecting identities uh, that impact people that they bring to the table. So I always like to start with uh, a thought exercise uh, as well, just to take a moment as you're sitting uh, at home or maybe you're still in the office, um, and imagine that you were to go into work on a Monday morning and your coworker asks you what you did for the weekend. Now imagine that you've been together uh, with uh, your significant other who's of the same gender for 15 years, but you aren't out at work and you haven't told anybody. How do you navigate that conversation? What do you say to your coworker about your weekend? You know, do you say, well, we did this? And then if they ask who the we is, how do you, how do you say who that is? Is it a, is it a friend? Um, I've had this scenario from a, a colleague uh, at a company up in Green Bay who told me that they'd been at their company for 23 years and they weren't out yet. So every Monday morning, people would ask what they did for the weekend. And they couldn't say, you know, my husband and I did this, my partner and I did that. They didn't use names or pronouns. It was all singular. They were hiding a part of themselves as they walked into the workplace each and every day. And that was a part of themselves that they were hiding in the community as a whole. And that had a traumatic impact on them on their own personal experience. It had an impact on their professional performance, um, but really shows that there's so much work to do. And part of this presentation tonight is how do we provide that space where, you know, at a Rotary Club meeting, someone doesn't have to hide part of themselves when they walk in, that they are comfortable saying, you know, my husband and I, that they're comfortable talking about their sexual orientation and, and gender identity, and that it's a welcoming and inclusive space. So as we start with kind of getting on the same page then uh, with, with language, I often like to define the difference between diversity and inclusion and equality versus equity. Uh, you know, in diversity, I always, I, I have a saying that I'm sure many of you use is, you know, diversity is being invited to the dance. Inclusion is actually being asked to dance. So diversity is about, you know, everyone wanting to be included, but then inclusion is really how are you actually including people once they're there, that it isn't just about spreading that net and saying, we want you to be part of this, it's how are you intentionally going about including folks. And then we often hear, you know, equality versus equity. And equality, you know, really refers to equal opportunity uh, and the same levels of support for all people. Um, and I actually think equity goes a step further. And it refers to offering varying levels of support depending upon the need to achieve greater fairness of outcomes. 
So equality really has become, I think, synonymous with just saying, let's level the playing field. Um, and I think we should make equity more synonymous with more for those who need it, that our work should be there are more who may need help. There are more that may need there. So our work, you know, really in diversity and inclusion is really in that inclusion side. You want people at the table, but how do you involve them once they're there? And equality, we want everyone to be equal, but it's how do we make sure that we are providing for those who need it the most uh, right now? So you know, I've already used a few terms um, tonight uh, in this um, that I want to make sure that you are all, that, that are clear um, and that I'm not um, assuming uh, knowledge that may not be there. So I like to start with some basic definitions that will encompass a lot of the presentation tonight. And there are three primary uh, definitions. The first is sexual orientation, which is that emotional, romantic, or sexual attraction to other people. There's gender identity, which is your concept of yourself, whether you consider yourself to be male, female, perhaps a blend of both. Your gender identity could be the same, or it could be different from the sex that was assigned to you at birth. And then there's gender expression, which is the external appearance of one's gender identity, usually expressed through maybe behavior, clothing, voice. Um, and, it, and it can or cannot conform to socially um, acceptable behaviors that may belong to either masculine, masculinity or femininity. So I have a, a graph here and I, I love this, but it's, it's a gender bred person, which I think really helps explain the difference between sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression a little bit more. You know, you start at the top with identity, the gender identity piece. It's how do you think of yourself? How do you think of uh, who you are? How do you identify? Do you consider yourself uh, a woman or a man or, or gender queer, where maybe you're, you know, you're in between uh, there? So that gender identity is what you think. And you work your way down where the heart is, that's the orientation. You know, that's are you gay, are you straight, are, are you bisexual? It's who are you attracted to? Where does the heart go? You've got then um, the biological sex, which may be how you, were, how you were born, but doesn't have to relate to how you perceive yourself. And then the shape of this gender bred person, uh, as you can see the expression, it's how do you present yourself? Do you present more masculine or feminine? And why we break down and talk about sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression is because there are different laws that impact each of those. And we'll talk a little bit about Wisconsin was actually the first state in the country that passed a statewide non-discrimination law to protect on the basis of sexual orientation, but it doesn't protect on gender identity and expression. So in particular, it does not impact the LGBT uh, or, or the T, the, the trans community. And we'll share a little bit more about that uh, as we get going, but I, I love this gender red person. So I've also used LGBTQ uh, a lot so far tonight, and, and that really is an acronym standing for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer. You may sometimes hear it referred to as just LGBT, LGBTQ+, LGBT+. There's a varying ways to do it, but in general, it's just synonymous with the LGBT community. Um, you'll often hear the word even more now, and that's queer. Um, and that's a term that people often use to express, um, you know, a real spectrum of identities or orientations that may be counter to the mainstream. Uh, oftentimes queer is used as a catch-all um, to include people who don't identify as exclusively straight um, or based on their gender, uh, sexual orientation or gender identity. Queer used to be a real negative term in the LGBTQ community. Um, and it's one right now that we're actually seeing uh, re-owned by members of the community. In particular, uh, young LGBTQ community members choose to identify as queer. We're hearing more and more, and there was a study that came out from Pew recently that talked about uh, you know, those in, in high school and college prefer to identify and label themselves as queer than they do as just LGBT, that it's a catch-all for them, that it's not just that it's a, it's a spectrum. So you'll, you'll hear that term uh, as well. And the other two terms that won't come up as much tonight, but may come up from time to time uh, in conversations um, are cisgender, 
And that is a term used to describe someone whose gender identity aligns with um, the sex that you may have been assigned at birth. So I identify uh, as a cisgender male. And then the other term is, is transgender, which is an umbrella term for people whose uh, gender identity uh, and expression might be different um, than that which um, they were um, assigned at birth. I'm just trying to read questions as we go along here. So I'll try to cover them. Thanks, Maria, for that. A uh, question came in, is it only appropriate for LGBTQ people to use with each other? I'm thinking you were talking about uh, queer. Um, and we're seeing it more and more um, used in mainstream as just a catch-all term, as kind of the, the general term that some folks may use. It is one that though I still find there are certain members of the community who it carries a very negative connotation with. Um, so it is one where I would be cautious and judicious in your use of that term, um, but that LGBT or LGBTQ is a is very acceptable terminology to use in there. So I put on this, um, I always like to include this one of terms not to say um, out there. And you see queer and it's got that asterisk because it is one, uh, Maria, to your point of, you know, you wanna be careful uh, when you use it, but other words like transgender and you see the ED underlined. The correct term is you're transgender. You're not transgender. Um, it's not a lifestyle choice or a preference. Um, it's not, you know, a gay agenda or gay marriage. It's just marriage. Uh, it's simply, you know, uh, and the other one is using LGBT as uh, a noun. I often hear people say, well, I want to engage LGBT in business. And it's like LGBT what? LGBT people, LGBT teachers, LGBT Rotarians. Who do you want to engage in that work? That, LGBT is an, an adjective, but it's not actually the noun representing a group of people. It may be the LGBTQ community that you're talking about, but um, I often get people say, well, I want, to, I want to support LGBT. And I'm like, great, LGBT what? Organizations, nonprofits. So these are just some terms to, to think about um, that you want to avoid from your, your nomenclature uh, as best as possible. So we talk about an overview uh, of the community next, which I want to share a couple of statistics that I think uh, are really helpful. And this comes from the Williams Institute at UCLA. They are probably the premier researcher when it comes to uh, LGBT demographics since uh, on a federal level, that information isn't fully collected. And they estimate from the Williams Institute that there are about 13 million uh, LGBT individuals in the United States that are 13 plus, right? ages 13 plus, so that's 13 million. Uh, you can see here, they break it down by uh, male versus female, uh, race and ethnicity, as well as age distribution as well. And I think it's really important to remember that it is a diverse community and that LGBT individuals don't all, aren't all the same. Um, you know, I was at a, a conference once and they assumed that everyone who was, was gay were straight, cisgender, white men. Uh, and it's important here when you look and say, 21% of the LGBT community is Latino or Latina. 12% they estimate is black. Uh, so it's important to realize that it's a diverse community that has intersecting identities, which have a significant impact. So this information as well as we look at the community comes from the Movement Advancement Project pulling from Williams Institute and others that in Wisconsin, they estimate that about 3.8% of the population uh, 18 plus identifies as LGBTQ, but there's a total population uh, in, the, in Wisconsin of about 207,000 uh, individuals, that 4% of the workforce is LGBTQ, um, and that about 124,000 workers, uh, employ, employers, employees, excuse me, uh, identify as LGBT in Wisconsin. And again, this is the chart from uh, the Williams Institute, very similar uh, lining up with the, the national trends around uh, both gender, uh, about the same on raising children. Um, you can see the racial uh, and ethnicity breakdown as well as the age distribution uh, as well. But really the, the profile in Wisconsin really matches that of uh, individuals, uh, the, the picture of the LGBT community uh, nationwide. I also think it's really important to understand when we think about understanding the community, it's looking at you know, the feelings of the community. Community Marketing and Insights is a national firm that does an annual community study 
to ask LGBT individuals their feelings on a number of, of areas. We, were a, we are a partner in that at the Wisconsin LGBT Chamber and we're able to get the responses and the, and the cross tabs for the, the data from those in Wisconsin. Uh, and, when we, and when they asked if people agree with the following statements, 86.9% um, said that corporations that support L LGBTQ equality are more important than ever. Um, there were, that companies that support equality will get more of their business, almost 86%. That pride events are important to the community that they tend to purchase from companies that market and engage the community. Uh, in fact, with that, there was one study that showed that LGBT individuals would be willing to spend twice as much on a product or service if they knew the company they were supporting was an advocate for inclusion in the LGBT community. And this goes to show when asked if they've made a conscious decision to purchase over the past 12 months, 83.3% said yes, that they made a conscious decision on purchasing because of a company's LGBTQ inclusive outreach, employment practices, uh, or supportive political stances. So it is a community that really does value loyalty and values companies and organizations that they know support them. They want to feel welcome, they want to feel included, and they know that you are, and they, and they wanna know that. So as we continue here, um, I think it's important to ask, you know, why does inclusion uh, in the workplace really matter? Um, and I, I'd encourage you to uh, fill in the chat here. Uh, what percentage of LGBTQ employees do you think uh, may not be out at work? We'd love you to drop in the chat uh, what you're thinking. Uh, what percentage of, of LGBTQ uh, employees are out uh, at work? We'll give it just a second here. About an 80% not out, 60%, 50%. 60. The answer is 46%. 46% of LGBTQ workers say that they are closeted at work. This comes from a report released by the Human Rights Campaign in June of 2018 called The Workplace Divided. One in five LGBT workers in their report reported having been told that they should dress uh, in a more feminine or masculine manner. 53% of workers reported hearing jokes. 31% uh, said that they felt unhappy or depressed at work. Uh, and the top reason uh, they didn't report these things to HR or supervisors is they didn't think that anything would be done about it, that they didn't think anybody would stand up and do anything about it. But when you have 46% of LGBTQ workers not being able to bring their full authentic self to work, it has a real negative impact. This was a, a further report from the Human Rights Campaign called The Cost of the Closet and the Rewards of Inclusion. And it really looked at the overall business impact um, that happens uh, from employees not being able to, to bring their selves to work. Everything from, you know, we started with the example of how do you, how do you hide yourself? 35% said they had to lie about their personal life. 20% uh, said they felt exhausted by having to, to do that, that they avoid, 27% said uh, that they avoided certain people uh, at work, um, that they avoided social events, uh, avoided working on certain projects or clients, feeling distracted. And, and where this really impacts is as we are now living in a, in a global economy, as we've seen by COVID, you can have employees anywhere and how are you building that inclusive space where they can bring their full authentic self? The cost and, and effort to recruit and retain an employee uh, is expensive. But are you building the time where someone comes and you, you have an employee where they can produce their best work? Or are they having to spend part of their day hiding who they are? Are they spending part of their day not feeling connected to other employees? That will have a negative impact on the company's performance, uh, but also on, on their overall mental and well-being as well. So that is a little bit about, you know, when we think of the workplace and just kind of why these things matter uh, for the community. And, you know, it, it's beyond just the workplace, it's just in everyday life uh, as well. That really does matter of how we build that inclusive space. You know, it is as one of the comments in the chat, you know, it's 2021, but we still have a long ways to go uh, as we build that equality. And uh, some of it starts with understanding the importance of, of pronouns. Um, so I would 
you know, start and I'd ask you to think for yourself for a moment. If you were to walk in, uh, say to the office, uh, say to a, a meeting, uh, a rotary meeting, and, and this individual and in the, in the picture here on the screen was in front of you, what pronouns do you, would you use to greet that individual? Or when you're talking about them in, in the third person, what pronouns might you, might you use? And just think for yourself for a second uh, on what that may be. And I'll tell you, it's a trick question uh, on it. I can't tell you what pronouns you should use. You can never assume someone's pronouns just based on their appearance. You can't assume that this person in this photo identifies uh, as a female or that they prefer she, her pronouns. So it's important to understand the importance of, of, of pronouns because it really has an impact as you're talking about other people, as you're you know, reading a biography of some, as you're reading a bio of someone, introducing them at a meeting, to understand how do they wanna be referred to uh, in the third person. So you know, pronoun um, you know, is the, uh, a word used to refer to either the people who you're talking, like you know, an I or you, or a person you're being talked about, like a she, her, he, him. And as I mentioned, people often make assumptions uh, of the gender of another person, maybe based on their appearance um, or their name, perhaps. Maybe you see something come in in an email and it's signed by uh, a Darcy. Is Darcy uh, a male or a female? And you might have an assumption in your head based on that, and that impacts your reply. Do you reply back? You know, if it's Darcy Smith, do you write back your Miss Smith if you assume Darcy is a female? And if you if Darcy is a male, how do they take that uh, there? So. I think it's really important that we make sure that we are being intentional uh, in our use of pronouns, that we are not sending a harmful message that people have to look or demonstrate uh, certain actions or behaviors to be perceived um, how they want to. And using correct personal pronouns really is a way to respect, uh, respect individuals and create that inclusive uh, environment. Just as using a name in you know, someone's you know, name is a way uh, to show uh, respect to them. You know, so I said, you know, pronouns are important and you can't always know by looking at them. It's important and, and it's okay to ask someone their pronouns. Simply ask someone, what pronouns do you use? What, what pronouns do you go by? Um, what you don't want to do though is, is misgender someone and that's incorrectly referring to them, assuming their gender identity, maybe based on their appearance it can have a really negative, harmful impact. Now, are we always gonna get it right and are always gonna remember? No, and we'll make mistakes and that's okay. If you make a mistake with someone's pronouns, apologize and move on. People understand and respect that and that's okay. But maybe, you know, but you want to make sure that you are being intentional about asking folks for their pronouns. That's why I offer them, uh, you know, at the beginning of my presentation and we're seeing more people add them into to email signatures, onto name tags, onto other ways so that you know how people want to be addressed. And it really is that, that sign of respect. And I've got a document here uh, that I pulled online really showing just some of the, the usage of, of pronouns. So it's the most common ones you'll often find and that many of us on this call use are uh, she, her, uh, or he, him. But many people will choose to go by they, uh, they or them. Um, I have an employee who prefers to identify as, as they. Um, that is, you know, that they are gender um, gender queer and don't identify as either male or female. So choose they. Some use Z or yay, and these are not by any means uh, an exhaustive list of potential pronouns. These are just some that are out there, but um, just something for folks to, to kind of keep in mind uh, as you're doing it. Um, you know, things you can do include what pronouns you use, um, you know, on your name in Zoom. You can edit with the three little dots and rename yourself and include your pronouns so people know uh, how to refer to you. And that's something, you know, pronouns are not just around the LGBTQ community, but it's around all individuals who want to be respected for, you know, being who they are. So that's a huge piece as we talk about uh, building inclusion uh, in the workplace. Um, I'm going to stop for a second and we're going to kind of transition a little bit to talk about, you know, the current status of LGBT protections um, as we continue here. Um, and I'd, I'd start with a question uh, to see what folks think of how many federal laws currently prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity? 
how many current federal laws do we think the folks think are out there that may protect on uh, discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity? Seeing a zero, a one, zero. Maria with the one. I'm gonna I, I, I'm gonna say uh, and I'll, I'll share a little bit more, Maria. I think uh, with with Title Seven, I say there are actually zero federal laws right now. There's no law passed by Congress that specifically says federal employment that covers federal non discrimination laws. Um, you know, federal employment non discrimination, for example, currently uses the words race, sex, pregnancy, religion, national origin, disability, age military deaths, genetic information, citizenship status. But no federal law passed by Congress, signed by the president, explicitly uses you know, sexual orientation or gender identity when it comes to non-discrimination. Now, that's not to say there haven't been uh, agencies that have interpreted it that way, um, but there are none that are at, that, uh, at the federal legislative level. And you take it then on a statewide level and you say, well, what's going on in the states? Um, if there's nothing federally, where do we fall? So this, this is a, a chart from the Movement Advancement Project that shows non-discrimination laws in housing, for example. This was uh, as, of the, as of January. And housing non-discrimination laws protect LGBTQ people from being unfairly evicted, denied housing, or refuse the ability to rent or buy a house based on sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, as you can see on this chart, 22 states uh, have state laws that explicitly prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation uh, and gender identity. Uh, but 21 states and five territories have no explicit prohibitions for discrimination based on sexual orientation uh, or gender identity in state law. So you could get married on a Friday, which the Supreme Court has said is right, but you could be denied housing uh, if you are gay in Louisiana, for example, on a Monday, just based on your sexual orientation or your gender identity. You see, Wisconsin is in the lighter green, which says we have a state law that pro explicitly prohibits discrimination based on sexual orientation only. So if you are gay, lesbian, or bisexual, you're protected, but if you are transgender, you're not. So that was housing. Here's public accommodations. And you know these public accommodation laws protect people from being refused service, denied entry to places, um, including you know, school, uh, retail stores, restaurants, parks, hotels, doctor's office, banks. Uh, and again, you can see the trend that there are still a number of states where you can be denied basic public accommodations based on your sexual orientation uh, or gender identity. Wisconsin, again, with just uh, based on sexual orientation. Credit, for example, is another one here where you can be, you know, credit and lending, um, where you can be denied uh, access um, based on, and even more states that don't have any protections based on credit. So while we don't have that on a, a federal level and with the state by state patchwork, I mentioned at the beginning, Wisconsin was the first state to protect against discrimination based on sexual orientation, actually back in 1982, the very first state uh, in the country. But we now have to go and update and modernize our laws to include gender identity and expression so that members of the trans community are fully protected as well. We've had many communities in Wisconsin who have gone above and beyond, and I'll share that in a moment. Um, but, and I, I cross out the employment on this slide, and that has to do with some of the work on the Equal Opportunity Employment Commission uh, that we'll share a little bit more about momentarily. Now, nothing on a statewide level, but many municipalities uh, in Wisconsin have actually gone above and beyond with their own local non-discrimination ordinance to ensure that individuals can be protected. So this is not an exhaustive list, but these are just a few of the cities uh, and county governments who have pass their own non-discrimination ordinances on a local level to really help build an inclusive community and ensure that people aren't discriminated against, not, not only in employment, but also housing, public accommodations uh, as well in their community. And I give a lot of these cities great work. I am hopeful that at some point we'll be able to do it on a state or federal level as well so that it doesn't have to be 
uh, a mismatch of where people can, can be themselves and feel safe uh, and protected. Now, uh, and Maria put this in the chat with the, with the EEOC. So the, e the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission on, a, on the federal level interprets and enforces um, the Title VII uh, prohibition on sex discrimination. Um, and it's really an important thing to note. And uh, Maria is the expert on this, so I will not go uh, and try to, uh, she's the expert on this. So Maria, correct me here if I get anything wrong at all. Uh, but you know, they held that employment discrimination uh, due to gender identity or sexual orientation was sex discrimination. So again, they looked at Title VII, we talked about that early, and it you know, prohibits uh, discrimination based on sex. They had an expansive uh, hearing actually, um, I skipped a slide there, head on accident. Um, actually in a number of cases that came before the EOC, they really looked at um, and enforced back in probably, I think it was 2010 to 2012 um, there, and they held that sex discrimination was or that discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity was a form of sex discrimination. Um, so they made that case. So that's where you can say some federal work happened. And that's actually what led to a number of uh, Supreme Court cases as many may remember from last summer that really looked at uh, specifically around employment non-discrimination. Uh, one of those uh, Harris Funeral Homes versus the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and looked at was sexual orientation and gender identity covered uh, by sex discrimination. And the Supreme Court ruled that it was, that it was prohibited. So while there may be no federal law passed by Congress, the Supreme Court has taken action, but only specifically as it relates to employment at the moment. So there's still more work to be done uh, in credit, housing, public accommodations, uh, and more. There has been recent presidential executive action, uh, however, by the new administration. Uh, President Biden directed all federal agencies to implement those Supreme Court decisions, which um, said that LGBT people are protected under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, but it also built on that decision um, and directing any federal agency with protections against discrimination based on sex to interpret those to protect against discrimination based on sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. So uh, a good step forward, but again, not codified into law. So could be overturned uh, by executive action from future administrations, which is why an effort is underway right now to pass the Equality Act. And several years ago, it was known as the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, ENDA. And that was introduced to prohibit discrimination uh, in employment and hiring. Uh, based on sexual orientation. Recently introduced and passed in the House of Representatives and now awaits action in the Senate is the Equality Act, which would add the words sexual orientation and gender identity to the US Civil Rights Act um, and make it uh, a, spe a specific class. And it would include not just in employment, but housing, public accommodations, credit, jury selection, uh, and other areas as well. So it's an important step forward that we're hopeful that someday we'll get passed on a federal level, uh, but thought it's always helpful to, to see where we are uh, currently. So that is uh, a brief kind of recap of, of where we are on a, uh, a level. So it's what can you do? You know, we'll start with the workplace with some quick steps that I think anyone can take if you are uh, at a company or at an organization, and then we'll go additionally expand from there outside of what you can do in the workplace to how you can be an advocate for inclusion uh, in general. So I, I always like to start with the seven myths about coming out at work, uh, because people, um, this came from the Harvard Business Review um, back in 2018. Um, and I won't spend time going in depth on all of them, but you know, one myth is that it's not a big deal. Um, it is a big deal for people, it's a part of themselves. And there's an idea that it's, it's similar for, uh, that the coming out story is similar for all people. It's not. Uh, someone, you know, someone's experience coming out is very different. Someone may have had a, a really great accepting experience. Someone might have been kicked out of their home for coming out. So knowing that each story is different. Um, there's also an idea that workers have complete control over whether they come out or they don't come out. And that's not the case. Oftentimes policies at work, maybe health insurance, 
uh, signing up a spouse on your health insurance requires you to come out to someone in HR. If you're transgender, uh, you may have to, you, there may be different policies or, or things that you need clearance on. So you don't always have uh, the ability to have complete control over that based on uh, company policies. Again, that it, there's one that about it, it happens just once. Um, it doesn't happen just once. It happens every single day, all the time as you are you know, introducing a significant other, as you're talking about uh, your weekend. It is a continual coming out uh, process. And there's often one that I get most often is that people are scared to come out because they're afraid of career risks. And it's actually not the case. It's actually, they're, they're afraid of social exclusion. They don't want to be left out if they come out at work. They don't want, it's not about advancing in their career. It's, are their coworkers gonna look at them the same way? Are they still gonna be treated the same when they go out for, for happy hour after work? Um, or, or how will their coworkers respond? So I use this as a framework to think about the work experience of realizing it's, it's different for everybody, but the steps that we take to build that inclusive space can be really important. And I think some of the things that can be done include, you know, first modernizing, you know, your, your harassment prevention trainings and scenarios to include examples around LGBTQ issues, developing gender transition resources for employees that may uh, transition. I was working with a manufacturing company the other day um, who was putting in place policies should an employee, they didn't have one yet, but they wanted to be thoughtful of if an employee comes um, to uh, an employee comes up to them and says, hey, I, I'm going to come into work on Monday. You know, I'm, I'm transitioning over the weekend. I'm going to come in on Monday presenting different than I do now. How does the company handle that in terms of switching emails, alerting other employees, changing uh, names on, on documents and things? So developing those, uh, making sure that your policies are inclusive, um, including LGBT demographic information uh, in your data. So. Are you allowing employees to self-ID uh, into work? You may be collecting you know, race and ethnicity data. Are you asking for LGBT data? We're seeing more and more companies start asking self-ID, specifically framing it on self-ID and sexual orientation, and then gender identity and expression is two separate uh, questions. Um, and I've been working with a number of Fortune 100 companies here in the state um, who are adding that in to their policies. So those are a few things, as well as evaluating, you know, all your benefit programs for inclusion. I think one that is really important is training all employees, not just managers um, on it, but your frontline workers. You know, I was talking to one company um, who, you know, had, they were at a hotel and they were like, well, we'll train all of our senior management on this. And it's like, well, you're training your frontline staff. Are you training, you know, those at the front desk are going to greet people so that they know how to be inclusive if someone walks in and terminology to use. A big one that I think anybody can do, and I think we can do this as Rotarians uh, as well, is looking, are our forms inclusive? Do we ask people for their pronouns uh, on forms? Do we uh, identify people to, to self-ID? Or do we only have male and female as the only options under gender? Or do you have more? Um, do you ask for a legal name? and a common name, for example. And there it would affect the, the trans community uh, around, you know, if you maybe you have not had a legal name change yet. So your, you know, your driver's license says one thing, but you present with a different name. So are you asking for that? Just little things to go through and make sure that, you know, are we removing references to, um, to gender, uh, uh, to gender, to just assuming male or female, but allowing people to identify for themselves. And that's something that you can do in the workplace. It's something that we can do uh, in Rotary as well. I'm going to skip this one for a second. Uh, other things in the workplace are, you know, supporting an, an LGBT business uh, or employee resource group, um, posting on LGBTQ inclusive job boards, um, including LGBT owned businesses in your corporate supply chain. Just a few things that can be done uh, at work to really build that inclusive space. But I want to, you know, focus a little bit here on the end really around what can we all do though as individuals. I think uh, we all come from different experiences, um, different workplaces, but there's common things that we all as individuals can do right now in our daily, uh, our daily lives to really be an advocate for full inclusion. I think, um, you know, that's part of, I think, what Rotary is about how do we welcome all individuals to the table. And um, I share this model. It's, it's this inclusive leader continuum that comes from um, 
a, a good friend of mine, Jennifer Brown, from her book, How to Be an Inclusive Leader. And it talks about four different phases of being an inclusive leader. Phase one being that unaware, where there's no understanding uh, of the issues. Number two uh, is that awareness factor, where you, you have some basic idea of concepts, uh, but that you're not necessarily active uh, on those issues. Uh, there's phase three, which is the active, where you're informed and you're sharing about these areas. And then there's number four, where you're the advocate, where you're committed, where you're routinely and proactively championing inclusion. Uh, many people say, uh, you know, I want to be an ally. And I think that is phenomenal. But I encourage people uh, to be bolder than just being an ally, to be an advocate. Allyship to me is a, is a passive term, that you're an ally because you're supportive and that's great. But how do we transition, you know, here from that, that active phase in three to stage four, to be an advocate where you are actively going about and working uh, on behalf of inclusion. So I think there are some things that we can do on a macro level and some things then we can do uh, on a more micro level. And, you know, on that macro level, um, it's com this, these come from uh, a, a book called The Longing at Work by Rhodes Perry. Uh, Rhodes is a, is a dear friend of mine from Oregon. Um, and the first thing he suggests is committing to continuous self-education. Attending things like this are a fantastic way on that macro level to continue being an advocate. Um, and the work that uh, the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Task Force is doing is key to that and providing those opportunities for all of us as Rotarians to continue learning. Um, but with that, it's not expecting others to teach you on it. Yes, I'm here teaching that and I'm happy to do that. But part of that self-education is you continuing to learn, finding those articles, continuing to read outside. It's also important to think that you don't want, um, you know, I, I do this in my professional capacity and I'm happy to, but not every LGBTQ person wants to go and educate everybody about the community. Not every trans person out there wants to go and educate uh, about the trans community. Uh, so it's really important to understand who you can turn to and ask those questions as well. And that's why self-education uh, is important. I think we need to apply an inclusion lens to our everyday uh, work. Um, I like to, many, of, many people I know use um, the golden rule, you know, treat others as you want to be treated. And I think it should be the platinum rule instead. It's treat others as they want to be treated. We have a job to treat others the way that they want to be treated. Don't assume somebody wants to be treated the way you do. Treat them how they want to be treated. Communicating the, the diversity, equity, and inclusion business case is always an important step in there um, and just explaining why this matters. Um, getting involved in workplace things and taking a leadership role in this. And I hear often from folks that, you know, well, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm an ally, I'm not LGBTQ. I, I, I should take a step back and I shouldn't be at this table leading. And it is absolutely okay. All individuals who wanna fight for inclusion on any level are invited to the table and are encouraged to be active, um, to take on those responsibilities. Don't think that you have to let others lead. Oftentimes it's, it's the allies there at the table who when their voice is heard brings others along as well. So please know that uh, that is something that is, is really important. And then there are things that we can do on this micro level. And the first is um, sharing your pronouns. So when you start meetings, share your pronouns. You know, good morning, I'm Jason, and my pronouns are he, him, is. Include your pronouns in your email signature or on your business card. And I put kind of two different examples. Some people might put it under their name. Some people might put it like right after their name. Uh, as an example, I've seen some people include a link uh, after it that says why it matters. And they link to mypronouns.org so that people can understand and read more. Um, and ask, you know, how should I refer to you? But on a, on a very micro level, this is something that if we all get in the habit of doing a little more, it really builds that inclusive space and, um, and thinking through how are we bringing people in. And this isn't, as I mentioned in the beginning, just about the LGBTQ community. This impacts your, you know, your employees. I use the Darcy example. Um, you know, how do you make sure that you are um, addressing someone as they want to be addressed and respected? And that includes then shifting our language as well um, and trying to avoid using um, gendered language and use gender inclusive language uh, as well. So, you know, that's shifting away from at the start of a meeting, you know, or assuming good morning, ladies, 
or hey guys and girls, and time to get started, watching your sirs and your ma'ams, um, and being more inclusive, you know, using terms like, hey folks, we're about to get started, or good morning everyone, or just good morning. Um, but you, we wanna make sure that we are not assuming gender identity based on, um, based on appearance, based on what we think about individuals as well. So, you know, this goes, you know, into forms and policies as well, but really just using that gender inclusive language, you know, and then, you know, as we think about it, when it comes to Rotary, Rotary has their LGBT fellowship, which I know, I think I saw the link uh, in the, in the chat box here. Um, and Rotary, you know, talks about three ways that, you know, all Rotarians can, through this fellowship, can really help uh, make sure that we're building an inclusive experience, not only in Rotary, but if we apply these uh, experiences to uh, our everyday uh, actions, uh, it goes a long way. And I'll, I'll go through each of them, but I encourage you, if you haven't, to check out the LGBT Fellowship. It's a relatively new organization. I actually learned about it through the Rotary Magazine about a year and a half ago and got involved uh, with it and are really working to say, how do we build a more inclusive uh, rotary based on um, sexual orientation and gender identity. And you, you have the quote there um, that there is uh, no place within rotary for racism, homophobia, transphobia, sexism, classism, or ageism. So when you hear comments, when you hear things, I encourage folks to, we encourage folks to edit, educate, and echo. And on edit, you can edit someone's harmful words by correcting them, disagreeing, or letting them know that their common behavior is not okay. That's one simple thing on a micro level. When you hear things that, whether it's about LGBT issues, whether it's about uh, race, ethnicity, ageism, whatever it may be, stop, correct someone, disagree with them. Let them know their common behavior is not okay. That's something that if we all do, we can set a tone because if you don't, and there's someone who perhaps there is a, a homophobic joke made at a table somewhere at a meeting and there is someone LGBT who may not be out who hears that and they don't hear somebody stop and edit and correct that, they assume that it's accepted. They assume that's part of what everybody thinks. So feel free to edit and let people know that behavior, that behavior is not okay. Educate folks then. Most people don't intend to cause harm, but their comments and behavior might be ignorant. So bring it to their attention can help people also modify their behavior and language. Educating people is a big thing. And then echoing. I think this is probably one of the most important pieces that can happen. And, you know, agree and support others who speak up. If someone says something and corrects somebody, thank them, reinforce the message. As it says here, one person's voice is a powerful start. Many voices though, create powerful change. So we all have an opportunity to edit, to educate and to echo. And doing that in Rotary, doing that in our daily lives will have a tremendous impact as we continue to build, build uh, an inclusive community uh, for all individuals. So as I wrap and get ready for, for Q&A here, you know, a couple things that I encourage is, you know, as next step, ask questions and continue to learn. You know, make sure your pronouns are in an email signature or uh, you put them in your Zoom when you're, you're on Zoom here. Um, support LGBTQ and allied businesses. Uh, and most importantly, to be an advocate for full inclusion in every way, in all ways. And I will say it's an ongoing journey uh, as well. Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion work is never done. Um, it changes, it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to realize we have a ways to go, but it's about getting started on that journey that really matters. And it's why I was really excited to be here tonight and get us get the conversation started so we can think about how do we continue that journey. I've got my contact information up here. I'll be sure to put it in the chat as well for folks. And again, as I said, I'm happy to, to take questions uh, offline, uh, happy to continue having a dialogue with folks who want to learn more, are curious and may not want to do it tonight or wanna to go deeper onto it. So feel free um, to reach out at, at any point uh, if you'd like to talk more, but would definitely love to open it up for, for questions and q and I'm gonna stop sharing the screen so I can see everybody again, uh, but definitely we'll open it up for, for questions. Feel free to put them in the chat or uh, however Lisa wants to help uh, moderate Q&A here. invite folks, if you're comfortable, if you'd like, by all means, unmute and 
comment on what you heard tonight, feel free to uh, ask a question of Jason or if you prefer the chat, whatever you like, it's uh, your time. Thanks, Jason. That was a great presentation. Really wonderful. Thank you so much. Definitely. No, thank you. Thanks for letting us volunteer you. <laughs> <laughs> hello, hello, Jason. Um, you know, one of the, the things that I find um, very hard or difficult in this area is people's religion. When their religion, um, at least they believe, tells them that this is totally wrong. Um, can you give any hints on how we can deal with that? Yeah, that's a really good question and a very big question that I have that I, I think I, I use it when I talk, when I think of religion, you know, I'm, I'm a religious person and I think about how do we make sure that I, I can't imagine religion where people don't want people to be happy, to live their authentic self, to be who they want to be, um, and that everyone is, is loved for who they are. And, um, it's not the easiest answer, uh, but there are ways to look at it. And I think it goes back to that, that platinum rule around people want to be treated how they, with respect. Um, and um, people may not always accept it, but it, it isn't then, if you don't accept it, move on and find people who do. Um, but it, it's a tough one. I, there's lots of work on that. And I could spend a whole lot of time talking about how in religion, but um, I am seeing, and I, I'm optimistic where I am seeing uh, it changed though. Uh, and there've been polling that has come out recently, um, generationally, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, political breakdown anymore. The youngest, most conservative individuals believe in LGBTQ rights that, you know, they, it, it just, it is a changing thing. So I think we will see in religion. I, I, I don't think everybody will always accept it, but I think we are, we're moving towards greater acceptance at least. Other questions I can answer. It's a great question in the chat, I think for everyone to reflect on is, you know, awareness without action is not acceptable. So what actions will clubs take to act on in this new awareness? And I think that's really important for all of us to think around how do we take not only this, but build an inclusive experience for all people based on uh, race, sexual orientation, gender identity, age, ability, um, how are we building an inclusive club experience that uh, makes people feel welcome so that we can continue to bring in new generations of Rotarians? Because as we look at it, um, you know, people want to be at places where they see themselves and where they feel accepted themselves. So it's a really important thing for us all to, to think about. Other questions I can answer. Well, Jason, I like the example you started with um, to imagine yourself in a situation and that when you put yourself in somebody else's shoes, you can get a different perspective on things. And uh, do you have any more of those uh, little uh, tests for us or? Uh, that, that's a, that's I, one that really hits me. And it, it hits me on that one a lot when I, that specific individual that I, I use in that one has been in his company, you know, was at his company for 23 years and finally just this year felt like he could, could tell people. And it's one of those things of what is that toll on you when, you when you can't let people know? If you think about going to a, a rotary meeting and you're talking about your life, do you feel like you actually get to build real authentic relationships with people? If there's always that part that you are constantly on edge around saying or doing or um, making sure people feel comfortable if if there's an outing do you feel comfortable bringing your significant other or do you, you leave them behind um, and what does that say then about your experience so it's it's just thinking through if you had to hide something how would that really impact you what would that mean to your experience and and you want to continue in that role or in that spot thanks i um i actually had to i didn't let my friends know that our daughter was gay until we had a party. And uh, someone said, I heard your daughter just married a nice Jewish boy. And I said, well, you're half right. She married a nice Jewish woman. And the whole room went completely silent. And that's how it came out. That's great. 
Uh, Jason, I've got I've got a similar kind of story. A friend of mine and I we worked at one place. He was out at that one place. I moved to a different employer. He then followed me, and he chose to be quiet or in the closet for six months until he got comfortable. So, you know, there I was sharing his secret in the workplace, but that was part of being his friend, part of being his ally. So, you know, we can, even though we're not in that community, we can still be, you know, part, you know, carry that. That's a great point, Don. And it's a great question from Liz in the in the chat. I don't I don't necessarily have an answer for it, but I think it's something for us to to for others to think about as well. But you know, are there other logos to show inclusivity and in things, and and how we do that? You know, within Rotary and, and other groups as well. And um, I think that's something the task force can talk about uh, as well. Hi, this is Dwight Watson. Can you hear me? Yes, Dwight. Yes. Um, I'm the chancellor at UW Whitewater and I'm an out gay person. And in my cover letter, I wrote that I was a gay person. Um, and so that uh, people will know to uh, that all as that all I uh, appreciate all aspects of diversity. And I wanted to be have an open and affirming and supportive place. And if they saw it in my cover letter and they felt it was uncomfortable, then the thought would be don't even ask me to come interview. So I'm encouraging people to put their um, identity up front um, when they are applying for positions. Uh, that was comfortable with me, but you know, I was 57 years old. I was actualized around my blackness and around my gayness. Some people might not feel so comfortable. What are your thoughts around any of that? That's a great point. I, I give you a lot of courage for leading with that. And I think I, you know, I realize I have that privilege as well though, because it's on my resume running an LGBT organization for mm -hmm. eight years that it, I lead with that so people see it. So if they don't want it, uh, if they don't want me for my full self, they don't get that. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that sometimes that's a, a point of privilege for folks who get to lead with that and get to apply for positions where uh, they get that opportunity. Um, I think one of the reasons we see, you know, with our job board so often, um, on for the chamber, people coming at all levels trying to find employment opportunities because they want to find that employer where they can bring that that self to work right away, where they know that there are policies that way. But I, I think it's bold, and um, the fact you're able to do that, I think, is is a real testament to you, and it, it's inspiring. Actually, that's a great attitude uh, to have with it because um, you know if they don't want you for you, might as well start it before you even get through the interview process and get to the yeah. door and they bring you in, um, and then you say, oh, by the way. Um, that's great. Yeah, yeah, that's the last thing I wanted to do, say, oh, by the way. But it cuts down on so many things, like, uh, you know, are you partnered, are you bringing someone, all those types of things, and, and just questions that you don't even have to ask, you know, because, you know, if I'm 58 years old and people are saying, you know, where's your partner or something like that, those are just questions I don't even want to deal with. Absolutely. And, so, and now they know not to ask. Thanks, Dwight. Mm -hmm. Jason? This is, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to share a story that um, my half brother, I have two half brothers, one is gay and one is not gay. Um, and I'm not sure if we're supposed to say straight and gosh, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. I, I for, Anyway, um, and, you know, he's 72 now. And his mom, even though his mother passed away, she's not my mother. Um, she never accepted that. She ended up have, getting remarried and having two more children, both of whom are, are gay, never accepted the fact that, that three of her children were gay or are gay. Um, and I think that, you know, that happens to a lot of folks, you know, who are going through these issues personally and their own parents and their own family members don't include them. So I think it is just so important for us to provide whatever inclusivity we can because that might be all they get they might not getting it be getting it at home from their own families that is a really great point and it's one of the one of the terms that we often use is um chosen family that in the lgbtq community that if you know your own family may not accept but you find a chosen family that 
believes in you as who you are. So I think- And are we a, straight? Is that what we're saying? That's fine, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you're totally good. So Jason, uh, to, to uh, Dorothy's question earlier about church, I'm a, I'm a pastor and uh, our daughter came out to us as transgender in 2011. So we've been on this journey with her and she's now graduated from college and now is an attorney uh, in another state. Um, but, you know, God, God creates diversity. We are all, every, everyone's different um, and embraces diversity. And to, to deny someone because of their, whatever, whether they're gay or whether they're transgender or bisexual, denies the image of God. And that's my, that's my opinion. Uh, so that might be a response, but I want to share something. I, I stood up in front of the Nina School District uh, School Board and presented uh, a, just a short paper. I just want to read a paragraph from that, if I may. Please. Okay. Uh, Glennon Doyle Melton, uh, you might be familiar with, and her book, uh, Love Warrior, says this. I'm going to read this. We can choose to be perfect and admired or to be real and loved, we must decide. If we choose to be perfect and admired, we must send our representative out to live our lives. If we choose to be real and loved, we must send out our true, tender selves. That's the only way, because to be loved, we have to be known. If we choose to introduce our true selves to anyone, we will get hurt, but we will be hurt either way. There is pain in hiding and pain outside of hiding. The pain outside is better because nothing hurts as bad as not being known. Many gay and many more transgender people are not known. They live life with a big secret they hide. They live that way because of fear. They are trapped inside, hurting deeply, and as mentioned before, many of them end their own lives. Our own daughter came out to us and said that she thought of suicide, and we said she shared a little bit more about that, but I won't go into that. I go on, but a positive school climate, according to the CDC, one that supports who they are, one that allows the, or a business climate or a church climate, or you can put anything there. One that allows them to feel socially, emotionally, and physically safe has been associated with decreased depression, decreased suicidal feelings because abuse and unexcused school absences among LGB, uh, um, I'm sorry, LGBT students. To quote blogger and pastor John Pavlich, quote, if my children are gay, and I might add bisexual or transgender, they may doubt a million things about themselves and about this world, but they'll never doubt for a second whether or not their parents are over the moon crazy about them. Business environments, I can create an over the moon crazy about everybody. And I think that's important as we move forward, whatever forum we're in, whether it's church in our neighborhoods, at the store, any place, I think if we can provide that safe environment for everyone, uh, we'll be a, be a better off society. Thank you, Paul, that was, that was beautiful. Thank you. Yes. Well, I think that's a, a beautiful note to actually end on uh, for tonight. I, I, there's nothing to do to top that. So thank you, Paul, for, for that. And, and truly thanks all of you for, for being here and your willingness to engage and learn. And please know that, um, that this is not the end of the conversation, but the beginning of a journey that I, you know, as a fellow Rotarian, we're here whatever way that I can to support uh, all of us as we do this. So um, thank you for, for the invitation tonight, Brian and Lisa and, and the task force and look forward to continuing the dialogue. Thank you. Thank you for joining us.
Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And it would be really great if we could find a way that the people who've been present tonight can somehow truly become advocates in their own clubs and other clubs, because it this is going to be challenging. Mm -hmm. It's going to be challenging. Well, we had we had to include women at one point, and that was oh, challenging. I, know. I, th I know we can do it. I no, know but we can do it. I know we can, but we really need to get serious about it. Oh. We have to work at it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great job, Jason. Thank you. Thanks, Great Jason. Job. Great job. Thank you very much. Jason, I think you hit it right on the head when you said part of this is generational. I'm, I'm uh, up there in years, and I know that when I was a kid back in the early 40s that... Um, People didn't talk about any of this. And it kind of surprised me. In fact, um, part of not talking about it was because nobody wanted to discuss it socially. And part of it in our family was why talk about it? We all know that cousin Henry is um, a little different from the rest of us. It didn't matter. And he had a partner and he, his partner and he were a part of the family and it, and it didn't make a difference. It surprised me as a young adult to discover it made a difference to other people. So um, I'm really glad to see it changing. Uh, it, it didn't change fast enough for a nephew. Um, of mine, but um, but he's doing better now. I think I think he may have hidden uh, his um, orientation in employment, but he certainly hasn't in the family. And uh, I'm glad to say that he is married and is raising a son um, and doing very well on that. But. Um, but I worry about him based on the things that you said about hiding the possibility that he may be hiding himself in his work life. And I want to explore that a little bit more with him. Make sure he's not doing that. Thank you, thank you Kai, for sharing that. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thanks everyone again. It was wonderful to be with all of you. I can't wait to be back uh, with everyone in person uh, at some point. I uh, get to meet and see all of you. So stay safe out there, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone.